Today as we start, though, I know when you go to a big church like this, it's tough to feel like you're seen or known. One of the great difficulties in larger churches is helping people feel that they are unique and singular. It's that way in a large family. How many grew up in a big family? So I grew up with uh, three siblings. There was four of us. And I also produced a family with four kids. And um, they were great. We had them quick. We had them quick. We had them quick, right? That's what men always say. We had our first baby when I was 21. And then we, uh, it went good. You know, we told our kids, uh, they said, where do babies come from? And I said, well, uh, daddy puts, uh, gives mommy a special hug. And daddy puts a seed in mommy's tummy uh, with the special hug. And it works. It's a great way to explain it to little, little kids. And so we gave a special hug and, and uh, the seed grew and uh, we were good at it. So I gave her another special hug. And then uh, I decided to give her another special hug. And then Gave her another special hug after that. So eeny, meeny, miny, no mo. No more, spe- well, I won't say that. We'll stop right here. Um, but we had them all fast. <clears throat> well, nine months in labor. That's not, we didn't have them fast, but we had all four were born in the blink of an eye. And so now they were all out of diapers, and that's a great moment when your last kid. Whew, how many parents know what I'm talking about? Uh, so we, had, we were in diapers for over six years. Yeah, I, I actually factored it out. It was 14,312 diapers. I did the math. And that last day when our youngest, I came home and you said, hey, Spencer, tell daddy that you're in big boy underwear today. And that meant the diapers were done. I just sat down and I got teary-eyed about all the wealth that was coming back into our life. Because how many know those $20 uh, diaper runs that just add up over the years? How many parents can say amen? It's probably 40 bucks now for all I know. Uh, but um, so the kids, Karen was morning mama. She was great. She did great with uh, breakfast and get the kids ready. I was kind of nighttime dad. I would usually do the baths. And then I put all four kids to bed each night. I would lay there for about 15 minutes. It was kind of an hour ritual. I'd go lay on the bed with our oldest, Jocelyn, who's our oldest daughter, and then I would lay on the, the bed and talk to Tyler, who's now one of your, one of your pastors here. Um, and we would talk. And then I would go into the little guy's room, Kramer, who's our third born, and then Spencer, our last. They shared a room until they were 16. They're only a year and a half apart. And they had bunk beds. And so Spencer <coughs> was on the bottom bunk. I would lay down there, talk to Spence about life. Kramer's listening. And then I would crawl up the bunk bed to the top and lay with Kramer and then Spencer would listen to what I was saying to Kramer. One night I was talking to Spence and I was done. I crawled up and Kramer was my last one. And he's probably four, maybe five, but I think probably four, four and a half. And he was very melancholy. And I got to the top bunk and he was like sad. And I said, what's up, little buddy? He goes, big old fat cheeks. He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not spickle. You're not what? You're not spickle. You're not spickle? No, no, spickle. Spickle. Special? He goes, yeah, I'm not spickle. (laughs) You're not special? What kind of devil in hell is telling my kid he's not spickle when he's four years old? Of course you're spickle. No, I'm not. He goes, Jocelyn, she's the oldest person. She's the only girl. She's Pickle. <laughs> Tyler, he's the oldest boy. He's Pickle. Bugaboo, which is Spencer. You go, Bugaboo, he's the little baby. He's Pickle. There's nothing Pickle about me. <laughs> what in the world? Where is this coming from? So as a parent, the first thing you do is you make a tent. You get a little flashlight, so we're under there. I go, son, why would you say you I said, yes, you are. I'm saying, God Almighty, help me, help me, help me. Holy Spirit, help me, help me. I said, wait, 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 wait. <coughs> I go, Crane, you know <coughs> Aunt Terry, my older sister. He goes, yeah, I know Aunt Terry. You know Uncle Doug, my older brother. I know Uncle Doug. And you know Aunt Jill, my little sister. He goes, I know Aunt Jill. I said, so. What's that make me? He goes, I don't know. (laughs) I'm a 
three. I'm born three. I'm the third born. You're the third born. I'm a three. You're a three. We're the only threes. Mom's a two. She can't be a three. <laughs> Nobody's threes but us. He goes, huh? I go, you and me. I had the flashlight under the covers. I, I lifted my finger and he lifted his fingers. And the, we touched like this. And I go, we're threes. We're th he goes, we're threes. I said, no one can be a three. You and me, we're threes. He goes, okay, we're threes. Spencer, you can't be a three. You know. <laughs> and from that point on, for the rest of our life till now, we throw each other threes all the time like this. We walk in a room, he's in his 30s, and we'll walk in. We don't do high fives, we do high threes. We just do three like this. He was a great little athlete. He was a great, he was a division one college quarterback, but he was a great basketball player, he had a great shot. He's dropping, when he'd drop a three, in the game, he would go up court. He would have his hand like this. He'd drop his three like that. I'd be throwing threes going, come on, baby. Three, three, three. We've done it our whole life. He's in ninth grade. He's dropping threes in this high school basketball game. We're in the visiting gym. And all of a sudden in the second half, three police officers kind of come around me. I said, what's going on here, officer? He said, sir, we're getting complaints that you're throwing gang signs across this gymnasium. I'm doing what? You're making some kind of gang? A ga oh, no, officer, no, that's my son down there. He was on the top bunk. We went up. I said, do you know Aunt Terry? Do you know Uncle Doug? He said, he said I'm not Spickle. And so we, we said that we did threes like this, and we've been doing we're, And the cops are looking at me like, do you need help? I don't know how the Lord does it, but somehow in this vast world of millions, billions, he somehow has made me feel singular, individual, and we have a connection. I don't know how the Lord does it, but I feel like the Lord is always throwing me threes and like him and I have this wonderful, beautiful thing. And even when you come to a large church like this, that relationship with Christ and that relationship with three, four, five brothers and sisters in this house in which you find your connection, your threes, makes all the difference in the world. And the Lord is here in this place to not see you amongst the scale and the crowd of this house, but to really look down upon you and call you by name and remind you that you have the trait and the image of your father and that you are not lost in the crowd. And every single person in this room is spickle. Mark chapter eight, let's go there for just a few minutes. This is a story you probably read, went through quickly in your Bible reading. Probably heard very few sermons on this excerpt of the story, but I want to draw our attention this week after Easter to something very powerful. You talk about the significance of a day. Here we go. The Bible says, leaving them. Who's he leaving? He's leaving this company of these Pharisees. Now, they're going to come back into play in the story. The Pharisees, the religious, had pushed Jesus for more evidence. I need more than what you're laying out. I can't believe in you without more signs. Jesus, it says, sighing deeply. <sighs> it says he sighed deeply. Like at the end of the day, that big jump house when it's unplugged from the generator goes. <sighs> That's Jesus feeling deflated. Because what he was giving these religious people, they were, they were saying is not enough. He said, you're not going to get another sign. The kind that you're needing. All the evidence that you need to walk in faith and believe. And so Jesus, in that kind of mood, gets in a boat with his disciples. So he left the Pharisees and he again embarked and went away to the other side of the east side of the lake. The Bible says, and they, the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Now, remember that line. They forgot to take bread and did not have more than one loaf of bread 
in the boat with them. So they didn't bring any bread, but there was one loaf of bread in the boat. Next verse. It says, Jesus began giving orders. He was probably not in the most relational mood. He was being very direct, and he said, beware. So when, when a sermon starts out with, beware, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 16's account of this same story says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaven of Herod. We know what leaven is. It's a cooking element. It's small. It's invisible. It gets inside. It's disproportionate to the lump of dough. But once it's inside, this small, invisible ingredient mixed with the size of what already exists, the power of leaven is the power to change the texture and size of anything. Only twice is leaven used in the New Testament in a positive term. It's usually in reference to mixing evil with the kingdom. But you have to notice that the Lord likens the presence of something small and disproportionate that's evil can change the texture and shape of everything. Amen. So he said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What is that leaven? The Pharisees, they were known for hypocrisy. The Sadducees rejected the resurrection, the concept of the resurrection, even before Christ rose from the dead. The Sadducees rejected resurrection, so their, their leaven was unbelief. And of course, Herod, what Herod is this? There's four of them in the New Testament. There was Herod the Great that lived at the time Jesus was born, and that maniac gave a decree to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem, went through the nursery and slayed the baby boys the way that Pharaoh did in Egypt. Brutal, total inhumanity going after children. So this Herod uh, is different, though, than Herod the Great. When Herod the Great died in 4 BC, Rome split it into four areas and gave it four governors. One of them is Herod Antipas, which is this one. He's the guy that killed John the Baptist and also helped legislate the crucifixion of Christ. So this is the second generation of Herods. They're called kings, but mostly known as governors once they became a tetrarch or a leader of a, 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 an area of land that's divided four ways. So beware the leaven of Herod. Now Herod had stolen, this Herod had stolen his brother's wife. So this Herod was known for his adultery and his worldliness. So Jesus says, beware of mixing the kingdom with just a little bit of worldliness a little bit of unbelief and a little bit of hypocrisy. Beware of doing this. Watch out for this. So the disciples hear Jesus giving this teaching in the boat and the Bible then says, next slide, they began to discuss with one another the fact they had no bread. This isn't what Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> but they began to discuss that they had no bread. Now, the Bible says they didn't bring any bread, but the Bible also said they had one loaf of bread with them in the boat, but they didn't bring it. Now they have no bread, and they're discussing it among themselves. They're in a small boat, but somehow they've turned their back on Jesus, and they're discussing with each other they have no bread. How do we know this? Because look at the next verse. Jesus, aware of this or perceiving this, he somehow has been left out of the conversation. Jesus, perceiving this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? And he's quoting out of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Don't you have uh, eyes to see, which is understanding? Don't you have ears to hear, which literally means recall? Don't you have memory? And he said, if I was talking about bread, have you forgotten what just happened? Next verse. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Next verse. 
when I broke the five loaves. Now, I know in a crowd this size, there's some excellent math majors in this room. This is gonna be your day. This is the day for the math nerd gets center place on Sunday morning. Now, I hated math. My math teacher, his name was Igor Zabitinov. He was a Russian man in the mid-70s. He's still alive. He's on Facebook. He's probably going to comment on this sermon from somewhere north of uh, Boston where he lives. He's retired. Igor and I have been friends our whole life. I never understood a thing this man ever said about algebra. Nothing. How many friends do I have in this room? I have a PhD, an earned PhD, but it is not in math, okay? When we had to do uh, quantitative research, oh my goodness, I've never spent more money on tutors in my life than when we did quantitative research. So Jesus said, when I broke five loaves for 5,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? He gives them a quiz. And they all go, <coughs> 12. And when I broke seven loaves for 4,000, how many large basket full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. Jesus then went on to say, he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And they're like, no. What are you talking about, Jesus? We don't even understand in this room. If you read this, I bet you've read it. Do you understand? Uh, no. What is Jesus even referring to? Why is he going down this path? I want to draw your attention to three major misses. These were a big miss by the disciples in this boat. Jesus wasn't talking about physical bread. He was talking about spiritual leaven, spiritual bread. The disciples were so disconnected that they thought he meant physical bread, and they thought Jesus was going to do another mass feeding of the multitudes. Jesus did 37 miracles in the New Testament. Miracle number 17 was the feeding of the 5,000. Miracle 24 was the feeding of the 4,000. They'd just seen him do this. And they hear the word bread, and they trigger in their mind to something natural and physical. So here's what happened. Jesus is out there. He's just had this frustrating conversation with the Pharisees. He wants to see if his disciples who have spent time with him are understanding the kingdom more than people walk in the streets in pop culture. It's like when he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, who do they say that, that I am? And they said, well, you think you're John the Baptist or uh, Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And then Peter got it right. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Is being near Christ and following Christ change your revelation of who Jesus is different than just pop culture? Hopefully Jesus is different to you because you follow him than the people that don't know him as they comment and describe him in the world. So here, Jesus says, hey, beware the leaven of unbelief, hypocrisy, and worldliness. And they hear the word leaven, and they think that Jesus is about to do another bread thing. So the disciples quickly form a little group somewhere in the boat. Did you bring the bread? Did you bring it? I didn't bring it. You got the bread? I don't got the bread. Jesus even though it's an intimate space, has to perceive their conversation because he's been left out because here's the first miss. The disciples forgot that who is in the boat is more important than what is in your boat. When we hit these crossroads and crises in life, we always default to a conversation that excludes Christ The first thing we do is say, just a minute, Jesus, we got to figure this out. We check the bank account, we check this, we check that, and we do an audit of what we have because we still think that what we have is more important than who we have. And they realized that they didn't even have the what. 
Well, actually, they had some what? We're going to come back to that because they didn't bring any bread, but the Bible said they had one loaf of bread. Now they have no bread. What happened to the one loaf of bread? You're going to find out in about seven minutes. Here's the second miss. These disciples form this little, they, they, they caucus together. You bring bread. I don't got bread. I don't get bread. Oh, no. We have no bread. These disciples didn't realize that Jesus could do for them what he had just done for others. This is one of the biggest breakdowns in our faith. We don't believe that Jesus wants to do for me what he has done for other people. We pray for people we see miracles when we have the same need. We leave Jesus out of the equation and we rally ourselves to try and solve ourselves because we don't believe Jesus can do for us what he has done for other people. One of the most glaring illustrations of this is especially when we have created a hot mess for ourselves in our life. The devil says, you can't ask God for help. This whole mess is of your doing. Yeah, people have done stuff to me my whole life, but it's probably not nearly as much as I've done to myself. All we focus on is what people have done to us and not what we have done to ourselves. All of it goes in the wheelbarrow, folks, and you bring it all to the foot of the cross and you dump it all. The pain of what people have done to you and the pain created by our own sinful choices. So in the Old Testament, famous story, Joshua takes over for Moses, leads him across the Jordan. They march around Jericho, a fortified city, a notable city. The walls come down. It's a huge win right off the bat. The next little town in front of Jericho is called AI. It's spelled AI, not artificial intelligence, but AI. And so it's nothing. It's, a, it's, it's the senior having to fight the freshman. It's nothing. So Joshua sends 3,000 people to defeat AI. And lo and behold, they get their lights punched out. The freshman beats up the senior. How could God help us knock down the walls of Jericho and we can't handle little AI? So they regroup. What just happened? They find out that one of their commanders, when they raided Jericho, had secretly stolen a Babylonian garment in wedges of gold, buried him in the basement of his tent. And that leader, with that secret sin, made the army of Israel weak and impotent to where now God wasn't with them the way he was with them. So they come back and find out what happened. The Lord corrects that situation. And now Joshua, he has to march 30,000 men to fight Ai. Something that should have been done with 3,000. Now it takes 30,000. Because friends, that's what secret sin does. It always costs you 10 times more than you should have paid. 10 times more sleepless nights, 10,000 more dollars, 10,000 more this or that. So they finally defeat AI after all of this ordeal. They walk away and another group of people come up to Joshua from Gibeon, the Gibeonites, and they go, wow, we've heard all about you. <coughs> what God did in Jericho. Joshua's going, whoo! Thank goodness the Jericho story is still on social media, not the AI story. And all that flattery just felt so good. And they said, hey, uh, and it was a fraud. These guys were dressed in old clothes, well, worn out wine skins and threadbare shoes, acting like they'd come from many, many miles. They were just right next door. They were trying to fake Joshua out, and it worked. And the Bible says, Joshua did not seek the Lord. It says it right there in Scripture, and he signed an agreement. Well, lo and behold, the Gibeonites get attacked. They pull out the warranty and say, hey, Joshua, you signed the deal. We need your help. So now Joshua has to march his whole army over here 
to fight a battle he never should have been in. This entire hot mess is of his making. Now, what happens when you're in a battle that you created? Because you didn't pray, you did something that violated, you knew it, and now you're living in the hot mess. You're over there and the devil's saying, if you think you're gonna pray and ask God for help over here, you're crazy. You better muscle up, figure it out, because Joshua is losing the battle. He's losing a battle that he created. How do you talk to God from that place? Very difficult, because the devil's saying, you think God's gonna hear you from over here? You better figure it out, dude, and then you crawl on your bloody hands and knees and elbows back way over here, back to the will of God, after you figured out how to solve the chaos that you just totally created on your own. But somehow Joshua goes, God, I'm in a crazy mess. I made it all. I need your help. And all of a sudden, God gives history one of the greatest, most scientific miracles in human history that even NASA acknowledges, the missing day. God stops the sun over the battle, over a battle that was created by Joshua's disobedience. How much does God love you and I? He will suspend the laws of the universe to get you and I back on track. When the devil says that you can't pray from over there, you, you made this chaos. I want you to tell the devil he's a liar, but your final prayer say, God, I am sincerely in need. I know, I'm sorry, I created this mess. Would you help me? And then suddenly the sun, like a hot air balloon on a windless day, it just suspends for a whole day. And suddenly the army of Israel, they begin to fight and they win the battle. And God puts this man back on track. See, we don't believe God can do for us what he did for Joshua. That's why we formed this little meeting and leave Jesus out of the equation because we don't realize that who's in the boat's more important than what's in the boat and that Jesus can do for you what he has done for others. But here was the greatest miss as we bring this to a close. Jesus said, I wasn't even talking about bread, but if you want to talk bread, let's talk bread. Let's talk bread. I fed 5,000 people. Okay, math majors, here we go. I fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and had 12 baskets left over. Then I fed 4,000 people, which is less than five, with seven loaves of bread, which is more than five, with seven baskets left over, which is less than 12. Don't you see? You're like, no, I don't see where you're going. <laughs> How in the world can you feed more people with less bread to start with? If it took seven loaves to feed 4,000, you would think it would take 10 loaves to feed five. But it took less bread to feed more people, and it actually created more leftovers, 12 baskets as opposed to seven. Amen. So what's going on here? Jesus said, you want to talk bread? Remember that one loaf in the boat that suddenly is missing? Where did that loaf of bread go, friends? One of the disciples was probably a neat freak, <laughs> stepped in the boat, looked under the fishing nets and saw a loaf of bread that was left over from a previous trip because the Bible says they brought no bread. So that disciple looked down and went, Egh. down there among the fish guts and the water and the nets and uh, man, the shelf life of this thing is done. This thing's lost all of its freshness, Ugh. usability. 
bleh, overboard. Because now they have no bread. First of all, in this room, I've seen the church do the same kind of thing throughout my life. They look at people who've been to hell and back, if I could use that phrase, who've gone through everything in this life and they go, man, your shelf life's done, man. You've lost all your freshness. You're not fresh. They do a quick evaluation of you and they said, ah, you're not gonna be on the journey. Ugh. Now, I'm not trying to trigger inside of us pity. But I also know how the human social construct works and how religion works. We look for the fresh croissant. We look for the fresh baked bread. We look for people with that right aroma. And if you don't have it, man, you're not gonna be part of the journey here. And so they threw it overboard. Jesus said, don't you understand if we were talking about bread? If five loaves feeds 5,000 and if seven fed four, and five fed five. You see, what they missed was this, that who's in the boat is more important than what's in the boat, that Jesus can do for you what he has done for others, especially when your life is a hot mess. He will stop the sun if he sees humility and sincerity in us. But here's the third miss. They didn't understand that Jesus Jesus, Jesus, when given full jurisdiction over the kitchen, when given full access to everything that Jesus, he does the most with the least. Now watch this. Okay, math major, some of you are already playing on your phone with this. Let's reverse it, and I dedicate this mathematic reversal to Igor Zabitnov, my algebra teacher in high school, if seven loaves feeds 4,000, and if five loaves feeds 5,000, guess how many people one loaf of bread would have fed? I've had two math geniuses work this out. They both agreed. One loaf of bread would have fed 12,000 people with 22 baskets left over because Jesus does the most with the least. Most with the least. Again, I'm not trying to trigger pity in our souls. This world needs more than conquerors. But Jesus can take your life that others have deemed. It's over. You're too scarred, too much time. You're a leftover. When that life is handed to the Lord, I'm not talking about fame and notoriety, friends. I am talking about kingdom influence and purpose. That life, when fully yielded to the Lord, that one loaf of bread that nobody wants, Jesus can feed more people through your life for the kingdom of God than he can through seven loaves of bread or five loaves of bread. Because Jesus does the most with the least. And think about the next time you feel that kingdom neat freak urge come on you and you go, oh, that person, eh, eh. we got to have a nice, super clean ride here. So uh, you really can't take this journey with us. Be very careful who you just threw out of the boat because Jesus can probably do more through their life than the most gifted croissant holding any mic in this world. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. Let's stand across this room. Let's stand. You know, the Greeks had two ways to tell time. The most known way comes from the word chronos which we get the word chronology or chronicle. Chronos. It has to do with segmented time, marked at time, predictable time. It's the clock in the calendar, chronos. It's how we build a chronicle, a story, a narrative, told over segmented, predictable time. Chronos. 
But they had another way of looking at time that really is overlooked. It's not about segmented time of a clock and a calendar. It's not about chronos. It's about viewing time through season and opportunity. And even the pagans understand this. They call it chance. It's the word that we get, that we use called kairos. It's different than chronos. Chronos is about, hey man, what time is it? Kairos is about, what is it time for? What is it time for? Not what time is it? And you got to be faithful with your chronos. You got to be faithful with clocks and calendars. But for us in this room, Kairos cannot pass us by. Not what time is it? Oh, it's, you know, 1137. That's Kronos. Kairos, what is it time for? Right now, what it's time for is you're feeling the knock, knock, knock of heaven's love against your heart. First of all, I want to pray for every single person in this room. I just turned 60. I've been thinking more and more about the Lamb's book of life that's talked about in Revelation chapter 20. I read it again this week. Everyone whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The Lamb's book of life or the book of life was talked about by Daniel. It was talked about by Jesus. It's referred to by Paul. And John the Revelator writes in that closing scene, Jesus said, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. We've had scores of people last night in the first service. I said, Pastor, I want to make certain that my name is in that Lamb's book of life. How does that happen? We simply have to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Our sins removed. The judgment for our sins has been taken from us by Jesus on the cross who was both the priest and the lamb in one person. The Bible says we have to believe that Jesus is. Acts 4.12 says that there's no other name under heaven. All religions do not lead to eternal life. There's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. There's no other name. It's only Jesus. Maybe nobody has shot straight with you. I want to shoot straight with you. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Have you been forgiven of sin? Have you welcomed Jesus as Savior? One guy got saved with two words. The thief on the cross is dying, and he looks at Jesus. And the other thief is, has a terrible attitude and is rejecting Jesus. This thief over here says he didn't even do anything wrong. He looks to Jesus and says, remember me. I'm about to go into the abyss. Remember me. And Jesus looks over and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Two words. Change the trajectory of eternity. I would like us to close our eyes, and I need to bring this to a close. You're in this room front to back. You're watching on live stream. You're one of the campuses. He would say, Pastor, I want my name in the Lamb's book of life. I believe that Jesus is not just something that puts my name in a record book, but comes into my heart and changes me and leads me and guides me. And I, I need Jesus in my life. I need to be saved. Can you remember me in this closing prayer? I want to confess Jesus with my mouth. I, want to be I believe in my heart that he is God's son raised from the dead. Right now, if that's you, no one's looking, no one's taking photos. This is just a solemn moment of total focus. Today, I want to give my life to Jesus. You come into this service. If that's you, say, would you pray for me? I want to become a Christian. Would you put your hand up high? Oh, my goodness. Keep it up high. Keep it up high. I want my name in that Lamb's book of life. Just keep it up. Don't put it down. Just keep it up. Men, women of all ages, all colors, everybody. It's so beautiful to see people reaching out to Jesus. This is what heaven's going to be. 
I want all of us, just keep your hand up. I want all of us to pray this prayer together, a simple prayer. Let's pray out loud. Dear Jesus, come into my life. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the dead. Forgive me, Jesus, of my sins. And heal me, Jesus, of all the hurt that people have done to me and that I've done to myself. Fill me, Jesus, with love and hope in your Holy Spirit. I am yours, Jesus, from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we welcome all of these people that just lifted their hand? Wow! Praise the Lord.